which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So the title of uh, my message today is identical to the question I would like to ask you. Have you seen and heard? But another question that kind of preludes that one is... Uh, have you ever seen or heard something very special, something that only a few people would get to see? You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is the solar eclipse that happened last year. You know, uh, that was a special kind of event that it doesn't happen, but it once every so many years. I'm not a scientist. I don't know how, how often it happens. But, you know, events like that are special. And if you witness an event personally, if you see something or hear something that other people didn't get a chance to, that gives you special qualification to tell them about what you saw and heard, right? You know, if someone asks you about something, you know, maybe you knew people who were inside and didn't get to see the eclipse, but you did, you know, what question would they ask you? What did it look like? You know, what was it like to be out there and to actually see it with your eyes, you know? I teach a logic class at um, a school in York, and I talk about this with my students. If you ask the question, how do you know what is true? Well, there's a couple of ways you can know. One way is by deducing something from what you already know. Another way is by knowing because a reliable source told you something and you can then believe it. But another way is observation and experience, right? If you see something, perceive something with your senses, you know, God has blessed us with five wonderful senses that let us take in information about the world and learn things that way. And that's what John is appealing to we have here a disciple who was special. You know, John was actually present at the crucifixion. He had ministered with Jesus. He had traveled with Jesus uh, for, you know, his entire ministry. And uh, he's the only one that the biblical text tells us he's the one whom Jesus loved. And so when you think about John's special experience, someone who was an eyewitness to the things Jesus did, who was an eyewitness to the crucifixion, who knew the resurrection, it adds so much power to his words here. That which we have seen with our eyes and we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. There's some, there's some interesting things that I want to point out in the language he's using. The word for bear witness comes from the Greek martureo, which means for to bear witness or to testify. You know, that sounds almost like courtroom language to me. You know, if you witness a crime or if you witness uh, an event that is uh, discussed in court, and a lawyer calls on you to testify, you swear an oath to tell the truth, right? And you're qualified not by education, not by um, 
what you've done or uh, anything that you've done to earn that right. You're qualified because simply you witnessed an event. You're special because you saw and heard. Amen. And John is using that language here. I am testifying to you that this is the truth. Another word that's really interesting is the Greek apongelo, which is used twice here. It's translated as show and also to declare. But other, in other parts of the New Testament, it's also used uh, to convey the idea of bearing tidings, you know. And whenever I think about the Christmas passage, the famous one from Luke, when the angel came to the shepherds, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Right? That's the same idea. In other words, I who witness the Savior personally, you know, one of only a few people to actually do that, I'm bringing this good news to you. Amen. And so this is such a powerful way to introduce a book. Not only is John establishing his credibility, his ethos as an apostle, but he's also calling us, inviting us to share in that same experience. Amen. He's basically saying, you know, in verse 3 he says, I'm showing this to you so that you can also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father. You know, so there's a tendency to put the apostles in kind of a little box to their own uh, simply because, you know, they were the only ones to actually physically minister with Jesus. And there's kind of a barrier that we think, you know, well, we can't really have that same experience. But John is saying, yes, you absolutely can. I'm declaring this to you so that you can have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, he's inviting all believers, Jews, Gentiles, makes no difference whatsoever. He's inviting you to share in the same kind of communion and fellowship that he himself had with Jesus. That is awesome to me. And there's another reason why he's testifying in this way. In verse 4, these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. You know, if you read through 1 John in the context, John deals heavily with issues like sin and with walking with God and contrasting those who are walking in the light with those who are walking in darkness. And that's an important message for us. But another reason for it is so that we can be joyful. Joy is another important reason behind what John is doing. You know, it's important that we as Christians remember that we have a special joy we have a joy together because we can rejoice that our sins have been forgiven, completely done away with. You know, we don't have to continue to come making sacrifices day after day after day. We don't have to rely on a high priest to intercede for us anymore because Jesus Christ was the final lamb. Amen. He's the one who brought a salvation that cannot be matched by any other earthly gift. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, amen. We celebrate the time that Jesus Christ came into this world. You know, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 tells us that God used to speak to us through Moses and through the prophets. But in these last days, he has chosen to speak to us through his Son, by whom also he made the worlds. And so, 
we should always remember that God isn't trying to steal anything from us. He's not trying to belittle us and to put us in a box. He's saying, you know, walk with me, walk in the light so that you can have joy too, so that you can share in this special fellowship, the same fellowship that was shared by Jesus and his apostles when he was here. Amen. And so whenever we think about what the implications would be for us today, I think it's important to remember that every single believer today, if you are a true believer who has placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have seen and heard in the same way. You know, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We have something special. We have God himself residing within us. That's something not even the apostles had until after the resurrection and ascension. You know, we have God's presence residing within our physical body all the time. You know, it is not a kind of head knowledge. It's not a kind of intellectual knowledge that saves you. It is an experience. It is something that you physically and spiritually interact with. God comes into your life and saves you. And so we can't use the excuse, oh, I wasn't there when Jesus was. You know, I didn't actually walk the earth with him, so I haven't really seen or heard. Yes, you have. Because the Holy Spirit continues to do God's work. And he continues to help his people share the gospel. And so that's a really wonderful thing, but it also places a burden of responsibility on us, right? Like I said earlier, if you're in a courtroom and you were a witness to an important event, whether it be a crime or something else that requires your testimony, it is important that you tell the truth when you're under oath. If not, you can be guilty of perjury. That's a serious offense, right? So if you have witnessed something as special as the salvation of Jesus, like Hebrews tells us, I love Hebrews. That's my fav- one of my favorite books. Uh, but, you know, if you have seen and heard the salvation of Christ, which is so much better than any form of salvation that the law provided before it. How much more important is it that we bear witness, that we give correct testimony to others about what God has done for us? You know, that reminds me of Ezekiel in Ezekiel 33, 6, where God says, I have made you like a watchman. You know, I have set you on the wall of the city. And if you see invaders coming, it's your job to tell everyone. And if you don't, and they come in and take the city, their blood is on your hands because you're the watchman, right? And so, peop- and so as witnesses, spiritual witnesses of God as believers, we share a similar responsibility because God has, you know, given us all the great commission to go into the world and to share the message, to share the good news, you know. And so to not do that is a tragic thing because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the body. We are the people who carry forth that great work to share the gospel with the whole world. Romans 10, 14, how can they they believe if they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? You know, now I get people, friends of mine would tell me all the time, well, I'm not a preacher. 
I'm not smart enough to argue with people. What about all these really smart atheists and scientists who ask all of these hard questions, you know? How am I supposed to do that? Well, the gospel is not a thing of the mind, right? It's not something that comes by intellect, you know? Some of the most intelligent people in the world are completely blind when it comes to any kind of spirituality. You know, in my time in seminary, I talked to a number of atheists as part of, pro, of uh, projects and things that I did. And you would not believe the things I would hear, you know. But a lot of it is because, you know, we tend to have something against the people themselves. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We wrestle against principalities and powers. They've been deceived by a lie from Satan. That's the problem. The problem isn't intellect. The problem isn't that they're not smart enough or that we're not smart enough. It's the fact that their eyes have been closed by sin. And praise God, ours have been opened. They have been opened by Jesus Christ. And so never underestimate the power of truth that you speak. Whether it be directly from the word, which we know to be absolutely true. Or whether it be a testimony of something, this is what God did for me. This is how God showed himself mighty in my life when nothing else could. Whenever no one else could reach down that far and pull me out or get me through this, God did it, and that's the truth. See, whenever you tell a testimony to someone, all you're doing is reporting what happened what you witnessed, you know? So that kind of puts them in an awkward position, right? Because you can't refute a testimony. They could say you're crazy. They could say you're a few cupcakes short of a picnic or something. But that's the only alternative, right? Either you're telling the truth or you're just outright lying to them or you're crazy. You know, but there's nothing that can really be said about a true, legitimate testimony. And you can't fake the kind of power that comes from bearing witness. The Holy Spirit works through that. He takes that and he uses that to prick the hearts of people. And that's what we should be doing as believers. Amen. And so in closing, I just want to challenge you. If you have not seen and heard, today is the day and now is the time. Jesus says, just come to me and I will give you rest. And John is inviting us all telling us you can have that same kind of special fellowship with us and with the Father that we had. And if you do have it, praise God, you have, your eyes have been opened. You now see the world as it is, not upside down like the rest of everyone else. But you also have the responsibility to bear witness and to speak the truth of God's word. Never be ashamed. Never be afraid. You know, Isaiah 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You know, even in the parable of the two houses, one that was built on the rock and one that was built on the sand, they're actually not that different. You know, the wind and the rains and the floods came and beat on both of them, right? They beat violently on both of them. 
but the difference between the one that stood and the one that didn't was the, that it was founded on a rock. And Jesus is our rock. Amen. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the... Mm-hmm.